Amen. We uh, return tonight to um, the first chapter of Paul's letter to the Philippians. And uh, as I have indicated, we, we want to focus our attention particularly on verse 9, 10, and 11. <coughs> and you will have taken note that we did not furnish you with fresh notes tonight. And uh, the reason for that being that because I've simply given you an outline, um, I am fearful that we may not get through this outline for at least three or four weeks. So I didn't want to be building up notes and then not actually covering them in our study. So I thought that we would just take it gently and, and work our way through. Uh, when I was in, uh, in college, um, quite a few years ago now, we, we covered subjects like hermeneutics and homiletics and so on. Uh, and, and these were designed to teach us how to prepare a sermon. And uh, we had this, this uh, lecturer, particularly in homiletics, who had this bee in his bonnet about three points to every sermon. So we were uh, told how to set the sermon out, and you had to have a, an introduction, and then you had your three points, and then you had your conclusion, and, uh, and so on. And we all, in the early days, thought, oh, well, this is, uh, this is good, this is helpful. We will be able to do this uh, quite, uh, quite easily once we get into the way of it. Well, I, I began my ministry as um, an evangelist and then eventually uh, went into a theological college and became pastor of a church. Uh, and so when I was the evangelist, that was great. I found these three points very helpful. And it meant that every night during the mission that we would have, we could have uh, a different subject, a different topic, and we would get through it with three main points. But then, when I went into the ministry, <coughs> I prepared my sermon with three main points and realized that time was up and we still hadn't finished the first point. So the three points would take us through quite a few weeks. And then in the end, I, um, I had the conviction that um, alliteration is good, it's useful and helpful to remember things, but in the end, it's the content of the message that is important. And, and if we're able to pick up a theme, uh, then uh, if we work our way through that, then I have found over the years that that is also very uh, helpful. So I'm just telling you that so that you will know why I haven't given you fresh notes for tonight. We are going back into the outline that uh, you had last, last week. And uh, so what we will do <coughs> tonight is we will just read this little prayer. And uh, I've no doubt that the more we read this prayer, the more... Uh, interesting it will become and the more exciting it will become because here is Paul, the apostle, <coughs> not only praying for the church in Philippi, but um, also praying for the church at large, or the church in general. Uh, and here we have an insight into the prayer. And this I pray, this I pray, pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, <coughs> that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. 
Amen. And we know the Lord will uh, continue to encourage our hearts with uh, the blessing of his word. Now, uh, looking uh, through in a general sense at this uh, prayer, verses 9, 10, and 11, you will no doubt note that we have covered some of the aspects of this already. If not in our Wednesday night Bible study, we certainly have uh, on our Sunday mornings. <coughs> and the reason for that is, <coughs> uh, of course, that Paul is actually giving to us here some of the, not only the encouragements, but the disciplines of Christian conduct and more particularly Christian aspiration. Uh, when we become the children of God, there is and there has to be a certain expectation in us. We don't simply grow content with the fact that our sins are forgiven and that uh, we are now sealed unto that eternal salvation. Therefore, we are guaranteed that inheritance in heaven. We are fully occupied with that concept, no doubt, when we become the children of God. But in spite of that, there has to be in every convert an aspiration, a desire, a, an interest in what God has in store for us. Because being a Christian is not just the commitment of a moment. It is a commitment to a lifestyle. And that lifestyle is no longer to be controlled by us, but by the one into whose hands we have now given ourselves. Therefore, it is, as Paul said, no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. So our desire as a believer, as a Christian now, is that we may grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and here in this prayer, Paul is drawing that emphasis. It's only been a few years since he was there and formed the church in Philippi, and we have noted how that uh, came about. And uh, <clears throat> Paul is, is wanting now to, to build them up and to encourage them. And we have noted that uh, Paul will use uh, words all the way down through these early verses that will uh, complement what he's praying for now in verse 9, 10, and 11. Uh, you will see in verse 6, for example, he uses that little term, being confident of this very thing. So Paul has been observing their faith and their works, and now he is able to say that he is confident that God has begun a good work in them. You know, there are many who sadly fall away, and the question is always asked, were they ever true believers? Or was it simply a decision that was made uh, in a moment of emotion or as a result of peer pressure? And uh, here Paul is, is clarifying that work of grace in the heart. Paul is saying, being confident of this very thing, your conversion was genuine. How does Paul know it? He knows it because he has evidenced it. He has watched their lives. And uh, he, uh, he has got that assurance, if you like, that uh, they are the real deal. Now, that's very important for us to, to grasp that. Uh, 
even at this point, because what Paul is now, is now about to pray for is not the prayer of a pastor for unconverted church members or adherents. This prayer is for the saints. Look up at verse 1. To all the saints in Christ Jesus. So this prayer is uh, special and it's significant. And in this prayer, Paul is confirming the work that God has done in you, he will continue. And he will do so until every work in you is complete. And that, that's the, um, that's the, the meaning um, of, uh, of this work of grace within the heart. Perfection uh, literally means complete. We are complete in him. In Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and we are complete in him. And the thought there, again, is perfect. So when the Bible talks about perfection, this is what it means. It's this work of grace continuing within us so that we are complete in Christ. Now, as uh, Paul prays this prayer, we have noted that it breaks down into three points. You see, I'm being very good tonight. breaks down into three main points. And that is, first of all, in verse 9 through to the first part of verse 10, <clears throat> we have the process of this maturing uh, love. And uh, that is uh, set out for us in three ways, and we're going to look at that in just a, a moment. We have in verse 9, first of all, the enlargement of love that your love may abound still more and more. And then in the same verse, we have the enrichment of love. So this is how it all comes about. This love that grows and abounds appears in the sphere of knowledge and all discernment. And the, the all discernment there means discernment at all times in all things. That doesn't mean that we'll get everything right. It doesn't mean that we won't make mistakes. It doesn't mean that we won't fall into sin. But it gives us the framework in which love develops knowledge and discernment. And then in verse 10, we have the employment of love. So what do we do with love? What value is love? What is the biblical definition of our love? And often when we think about love in the Bible, we, we put that into the category of our relationship to one another, uh, to strangers, uh, and how we react and act uh, to others, that that's the sphere of love. But here, here in essence, is how Paul sees it. Verse 10, that you may approve the things that are excellent. The word approve there, as you know, it means that it gets our vote, it gets our tick of approval. It is something that we see value in uh, to the extent that we want to have it as a part of our lives. And uh, we have built into this, you know, the concept of the uh, superlatives. Good, and better, and best. And what Paul is saying here is we don't settle for the good if we can have better. But we don't settle for the better if we can have the best. So that's what Paul is saying here, that you may approve the things that are 
excellent. So that's the very top. That's where we need to uh, strive to, to gain. Uh, then he goes on to talk about the purpose um, of maturing love. And you'll see that in the second part of verse 10, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. And then into verse 11, we have the power of maturing love. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. So let's, uh, with the limited time that we have, let's just uh, break down this first uh, thought uh, expressed by Paul, the process of uh, maturing love. And we'll take a little look at, at the three distinct movements, if, if you like, that are found in verse 9. The first one is uh, the enlargement of uh, love. And, and that becomes very clear, that your love may abound still more and more. So Paul is drawing our attention to uh, three things. Uh, plentitude, uh, more and more. Progress, more and more and persistence more and more. <coughs> so the three thoughts are, are tied up with this. So let's just take a moment now to break this down. This I pray that your love may abound. We've heard this word before and we have noted that it means that you not only have enough to supply your need, but you have surplus. This is the abounding love. Now this word abound appears no less than um, 90 times in the New Testament. So it's a, it's a solid word that serves to instruct us in how we ought to enlarge our capacity and not only to know Christ, but to live him in the world that is uh, around us. Uh, there are two words that are used in the New Testament to describe God's dealings with his people. There is the word sufficient and the word abound. Now, we've looked at this before, but let's just look at one or two references that will help us to to work this into our mind and into our heart. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Second Corinthians chapter 3. And uh, just have a little look at, at well, this whole chapter is uh, developing this theme uh, of the contrast between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And Paul goes to great lengths to describe, as it were, the weaknesses of the Old Covenant. And he sums that all up by uh, the fact in verse 11, if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. So he, he refers to the old covenant as a passing glory. And this is what we've been looking at in our Sunday evening studies in the book of Hebrews. And we'll be uh, continuing with that theme on Sunday night, God willing. But coming down uh, into verse 3, Paul says, Clearly you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us 
Uh, note how Paul puts that. Paul is simply saying, I was just the instrument that God used. And, and the, the metaphor here is that of a pen. And what Paul is uh, saying, in essence, is if you have a pen and you put it on the desk, it won't matter how much you look at that pen, it won't do a thing but simply sit there. So if that pen is going to be effective and useful, what does that pen need? That pen needs a living hand. So when I take the pen up in my hand, I can now use the pen to write a letter or to do a drawing or whatever. The pen has no life in itself. It is only when it is in the hand of a living person. So when you, uh, when you read this, Paul is saying, clearly you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. So that's, uh, that's the area that Paul is drawing us into. And now look at verse 4 and 5. And we have such trust through Christ toward God. He's simply uh, confirming here, this is what we believe is God's purpose and God's uh, program. This is how God brings sinners to repentance. He uses people. But ultimately, ultimately, he does the work. Remember how uh, Paul brings it out in, in Romans chapter 10 when he says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But how will people hear if there isn't a preacher to explain the gospel to them. But at the end of the day, Apollos may sow and Paul may water, but it's God who gives the increase. Ultimately, it's the work of God, a work of grace. Sunday morning, we're going to be looking through the gospels a little, just confirming, uh, as Paul writes to the uh, Thessalonians, and he, he speaks of how the gospel went forth from them. So the example wasn't only to them, but the example to the world was through them. And that, that's the next phase of our walk with God. But here is uh, what Paul is declaring. We have such trust through Christ toward God. So if God calls you to share the gospel with someone, do it. You might say, well, I'm only a pen. What can I do? The reality is, if you're in the hands of God, you become a pen that writes a message. And uh, Paul has told us what that message is in verse 2. You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. So we come back down now into verse 5. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. And then he adds, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. So here Paul is, is telling us, whatever task God calls us to, we are sufficient for that task, only because God has chosen to use weak vessels to bring honor and glory to his name. And then we don't need to turn to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9, for you all know uh, 
uh, how the apostle, when speaking about the thorn in the flesh and the oft times that he requested it to be removed, and God said, Paul, I've already told you, I'm not listening to you, and uh, you're not going to get rid of that thorn. So just be content, settle down, and bear it. And here is what. I will give you the grace to bear it. So what does Paul say? Well, in the midst of all of that discussion, what Paul heard was, my grace is sufficient for you. And then Paul goes on to speak about, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. And the word given there means given as a gift. Uh, Paul learned to embrace it. He, he struggled against it initially, but he learned to embrace it because he understood that while he was praying, Lord, take away this thorn so that I can serve you better. God was saying, Paul, I want you to keep the thorn and then you will serve me better. And uh, as we go through Paul's epistles, we can see the evidence of that. And sometimes what we fear or feel to be our greatest disappointment becomes our greatest encouragement. Uh, we just have to learn how to be patient and how to wait uh, for God to manifest his purposes to us. Uh, and so that word sufficient appears uh, several times throughout the New Testament. Now the second word is, uh, is this word abound uh, in verse 9 of Philippians chapter 1. And the word, the word bound or abound means beyond measure beyond measure. So sufficient is a measurable bestowal of grace. God knows how much we need. So he gives us that measure of grace. But this word abound means that it is beyond measure. God doesn't only fill us up, but he spills out his grace to others. And uh, one of the great texts you will note in Romans chapter 5 and in verse 20, we read, Where sin abounded, grace did abound more. And uh, that's the, the glad and the glorious news of the gospel. doesn't matter how sinful we may be, the grace of God can reach us. It doesn't matter if our sins mount up to the heavens. God can wipe the slate clean and purify our heart. That is abounding grace. Come over into 2 Corinthians and uh, chapter 9. And uh, look at verse 8. This is the thought that Paul is conveying. And God is able to make all grace, note, God is able to make all grace abound. See, we're not just looking at grace. Uh, Ephesians you know, chapter 1 tells us, for by uh, chapter 2, by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And the grace that is uh, referred to there is saving grace. So that's enough grace to save us. That's the grace that God gives us. But now we read, and God is able to make all grace. So what happens when God releases all grace toward us. Here we, uh, we read, God is able to make all grace abound 
towards you. So here we have again this thought of not just enough to meet our need, but that grace that spills over, that fills up every aspect of our lives. That you always, you see, that's, that's the difference between the abounding grace and the sufficient grace. Sufficient grace meets us at the point of our need when our need arises. But abundant grace is with us all the time. And that is the point that Paul is making here. That you always having all sufficiency in all things. So out of this abounding grace that is always there, God gives us this sufficient grace to meet our need. And then what happens? That you always having all sufficiency, all sufficiency. So there's no lack, no shortage. Whatever you need, God will ensure that he gives it to you. Always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. See, grace will always have a purpose. God will not give you grace if you don't need that special sufficient grace. I've had many people over the years who have indicated that they have a fear of dying. And, and that's a genuine, real fear. What will happen when the time comes for me uh, to die? Will I be able to face that moment without fear? And my response to them has always been, well, have you proved God in your life thus far? And they will agree, yes, every time that we have needed God, he has been there to help us. Well, do you think that it's going to be different when it comes to death? That lovely 23rd Psalm puts it so well when it begins with a shepherd out there in front. He leads me and he feeds me and, and so on. The shepherd's out in front and the sheep are following but then when we come to the fearsome valley of the shadow of death, it all changes. And uh, we read, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are no longer out there in front leading me, but you are now with me. And where... The first part of the psalm is all about the Lord is my shepherd. I shall know he leads me. So that is a remote connection, explaining that broader relationship. But now in the valley of the shadow of death, it becomes intimate. I will fear no evil for it's not he is with me but it is you are with me. I will fear no evil because you know that this is my moment and you have come all the way back here to be with me at this point in time. You see, God's grace will always be <coughs> sufficient for us in all things. Uh, so there in Second Corinthians 9 and uh, Verse uh, 8, Paul says that this abundance of grace is for every good work. So we work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And how do we do that? Knowing that it is God who is at work in us, both to will and to do, of his good pleasure. So God ensures that the work he wants us to do is accomplished. We are able to do it. How does he ensure that? By his ab uh, abounding uh, 
or abundant grace. But uh, not only does uh, Paul speak of uh, plentitude, but he also speaks of um, progress. And uh, he does that simply in those few little words in verse 9, still more and more. Now, we don't have time to get into this uh, tonight, but I want to leave you with uh, this reference. Come over into chapter 4 of uh, Philippians. Um, Paul is still writing to this uh, body of believers in Philippi. He has set out in the first verses of the first uh, chapter his delight not only in where they are at the moment, but where he knows God is taking them. And so he's really encouraging them along that journey. But over in chapter 4, we have a problem. Because Paul had a problem. Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. And then he hits on a problem in the church. I implore. And uh, he raises the concerns over two ladies in the church. Now, it could just as easily have been two men, but here it happens to be two of the ladies. And what's their problem? They can't agree with each other. And they're falling out, not so much over the school playground or school lunches or which uh, shop is the best one to shop in. They're not falling out over the menial tasks of the day. Look at what Paul says. I implore them to be of the same mind in the Lord. They're going to the same church, but they don't agree on uh, what the church is, is teaching them. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. So what, what is this rejoice? Um, that Paul is referring to. What has that got to do with uh, not being of the same mind in the Lord? See, Paul is back to fellowship. And what's at the heart of fellowship? Love. Obviously, these two ladies had fallen out of fellowship because they'd fallen out of love. And as a result, they are damaging the witness of the church. So Paul is saying to them, settle down. Remember what God has taken you from, what God has already performed in your lives, and come together on those issues and set aside anything that is uh, causing division or dissension in the church. Uh, we'll come back into that in more detail eventually as we work our way through this, uh, this letter. So there is a hint of a potential problem in the fellowship and because of that there is need for their love to mature. And we'll just finish off because we're very close to it with 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and uh, we'll look at verse 4 through to the first part of verse 8. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up does not behave rudely, 
does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. So what do we need to do? We need to take our Bible and uh, we need to have uh, our finger in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and another finger in Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. And we read in Philippians, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more. And then we flick back to 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, and we read all about love. That is how our love ought to grow. In these sensitive areas, of our communication and our relationship with one another. Because if we fail in this, then it is our fellowship that suffers. So that's the burden of uh, the Apostle Paul, and it ought to be our burden as well. Let's have a little prayer. Our loving Father, we thank you for this precious time when we are able to share together around the scriptures. We thank you that they are not only informational, they're not only uh, such that build us up in our knowledge and, and, and uh, equip us uh, so that we are able to defend our position. Uh, but also your word is a practical word. It also shapes our lives. It fashions us just like clay upon a potter's wheel. Uh, you're able to prune us like a vine uh, in order that we may glorify you in the fruit that we bear. And we confess tonight that there are times when we need a little topping up of abounding love. There are times when we need to have that sufficient grace so that in our hardship, in the challenges of our lives, we are able to overcome and therefore to set an example to others. And so we pray that as we learn about this love that we must have, that you will teach us how to respond to your word and how to apply this word to our hearts. And this we pray in our Saviour's name and for his sake. Amen.